we're going to start off by talking about residents. Any system that is uh, going to function as a musical instrument, whether it's a string or a wind column, uh, trumpet being a wind column instrument, pianos, guitars, violins being string instruments, flutes a wind column instrument, things of that nature. Anything that you're dealing with that produces musical tones is dealing with resonance. Anything that resonates will produce more than one tone. In other words, a given string will play not only its so-called fundamental note, it'll play a whole series of harmonics. A trumpet, for example, will not only play the fundamental, it'll play a whole series of harmonics. Okay. So let's just kind of review that real quickly. I've got a string set up here. It's a white string. Might be a little hard to see in the picture, but I think you can see it all right. Um, and I've got it set up with a speaker right over here. And the speaker is going to drive this thing. And as I turn it up, we're going to see this thing start to look like a jump rope. This is what's called the fundamental frequency of the string. We have a great big motion in the middle. And here at this end and back at this end, it's fixed. I'm driving it a little bit off the, off the node. These parts that are fixed are called nodes. This big wild action in the middle is called an anti-node. Okay? Everything that I would demonstrate here will work exactly the same way for a wind column instrument. Okay? I have the fundamental plane. It's around 9.29 hertz. I'm going to dial the frequency up and we should see something happen around 18 hertz. which is about double the original frequency. If you look carefully, you'll see that I've got a node in the middle and two anti-nodes. Now I'm going to add another 9 hertz or so, increase the frequency. Now if you look carefully, we've got three anti-nodes. One here, one here, one there. There are one, two, three, four nodes. If you've been watching carefully, I start off with one anti-node, then two, then three. We can get four. One, two, three, four anti-nodes. I'm going to ask you to take it on faith that I get five, six, seven, eight, and nine. It's all integer multiples. Okay. At the node, and there's a node right here in the middle, I can pretty much just touch this thing and you aren't going to see much change in it. There's very little activity there. In a pressure wave, standing wave like this in a trumpet, you have the same sort of thing going on. I could drill a hole in my trumpet where a node occurs in the pressure wave and it will not change the way the instrument plays because there's no activity there. It's another ball game if I come over here and grab it at one of the antinodes. I shut the whole thing down. Shut the whole thing down. So if there were an antinode in the pressure wave inside of a trumpet, if I drilled a hole at that point, it would make the thing uh, stop. It would stop it. Tremendous activity at the antinodes. Very little activity at the nodes. Okay? Let me make a connection now between this string and uh, an actual wind instrument. And with that, I'm not going to take up a trumpet. I'm going to grab something else. This is a penny whistle. Just a B-flat penny whistle, not particularly fancy. Okay. Now, I'm going to keep all the holes covered up, and this will produce a low B-flat. That's the fundamental, where there was just one big jumping rope frequency. Okay, jumping rope note, if you will. If I add a little energy to it, I can get the one where there were two antinodes. That's referred to as the second harmonic or the first overtone. Now, most of the people who are coming to my website are musicians. You'll immediately hear that as an octave. I was able to get three anti-nodes. That would be three times the fundamental. That would be the second overtone or the third harmonic. Listen to what that is. That's the fifth. If I go to four, that's doubling again. So that should be another octave. Five has another interesting quality for our ears. That's the third. Six is another fifth. Seven would be a flat seven. It's a little hard to get on this horn. And then if I hit it, eight is another octave. Okay. Not real sure how that's going to come out with the AGC and the, and the camera and all. 
but if you're listening carefully, I just built up sort of a major chord. I had B flat, an octave above it, a uh, fifth above that, another octave, a third, a fifth, flat seven, and then another octave. It gets closer together as you get farther up in the series, and that has ramifications for natural trumpet, but that'll be another segment. Now, the point of this is that uh, this is how we get the bugle call notes on a trumpet. And it also points out that those, that overtone series that you saw here with a string, had this been driving something that would actually produce a sound, and actually if I, if I had this fixed up to the soundboard like in a guitar, you could have heard those notes. It'd be very low. It's like a bass guitar with these frequencies. And they would have followed exactly the same pattern. That one, three, five, seven, nine, all that, or sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that integer multiple series is basically producing what we hear as a major chord. Uh, actually, dominant seventh chord when we get up to that point. And all the notes start to fill in at the top and blur together, forming sort of a perverted major scale on top of that. Uh, trumpet does exactly the same thing. It does it in a slightly stranger fashion from the strings, and that'll be the subject of another segment later on. Okay? But that means there's a series of nodes and antinodes in the horn. It's in a pressure wave, but it's still nodes and antinodes. At the antinodes in the wind column in the horn, the pressure is varying like crazy, which means it's slapping the inside of the bell or pulling away from it. It's either hitting it or sucking away from it. And it's varying like crazy. Okay? Uh, at the nodes, there's almost no activity. For that matter, when you play an E, just above uh, uh, third space C, when you play that E, um, what's going to happen is there's actually a node right about where your water key is. And you can usually open up the water key and let it spit out while you're playing, as long as you're playing an E. If you're playing a D or another note, there's part of an anti node there, and as soon as you open up the hole, the whole thing falls apart. Just like when I stuck my hand and I stopped the anti node over there. Because there are anti nodes appearing in the wind column, that actually tends to shake the bell a little bit. At the, it's it's, it's going to provide some vibration to the bell. And at the nodes, there's nothing happening. There always has to be a node at the bell because there's no, there, there, it can just push right out into the room. So there's always a pressure node at the bell. But there are pressure anti nodes appearing very regularly, just like they did regularly in the string throughout the trumpet. Because of that fact, the trumpet gets a lot of shaking going out to it. Whether or not the bell is shaking all has almost no impact on what you hear as the sound by itself. But here's something that was pointed out to me because every trumpet player knows that when you play a lightweight horn, it seems to produce a slightly brighter sound. But here's a thought that was offered to me and I think it makes a lot of sense. Whenever you're playing any kind of a musical instrument that has, involves resonance, you're dealing with something called feedback, which means some of the sound or energy has to be fed back to the sound generator. Uh, in this case, that's your lips. Well, when we, the, most of that is just coming from the wind column itself. There's waves being reflected back and forth in the wind column, just like the waves are being reflected back and forth in the string. So most of the feedback comes naturally through the wind column. But if the horn is shaking, that can also shake the mouthpiece a little bit, and some of those vibrations can actually get back into your lips and provide some mechanical feedback directly to your chops. Um, it won't be a lot, but it may very well be enough to affect the timbre or the horn and may very well be enough to affect our playing of the horn. This is a New York Trumpet Company, Stage 1 California Light B-flat. Now by light, Felix designed it differently. There's no bracing in here or here. The only bracing is there are, there are two beads right here. There's a bead here, here, and there's another bead at the bell. Once again, the metal stock is fairly thick, so it feels like a medium weight horn. Not a heavy weight, but a medium weight horn. It does not feel like a lightweight. This feels pretty tough. Uh, I could hit somebody with this and defend myself if I had it to. Um, but because there's no bracing in here, this bell vibrates like crazy. And so I get a sort of a, uh, have my cake and eat a two thing going on. I have a middle weight horn that feels sturdy in my hands, uh, plays very, very well, and yet it provides some shaking for my chops and provides some feedback to my chops that way. Uh, and that's all, that's all I have to say about that. So a little bit of physics, a little bit of physical understanding to try to get a, a better idea about perhaps what kind of horn you might want to use for your needs. There you have it.